For years in the Western world, it was thought to be blasphemous to build higher than a church spire. The stories of the Old Testament warned against reaching too close to the heavens. The builders of the Tower of Babel declared, Come, let us build a city and a tower with its top in the heavens, and let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be scattered upon the face of the whole earth. But God punished them for building a monument to humanity and not to God by confusing their language so they could no longer work together. This story is used as a source of our world's languages for the religious, and some still use it as an argument against their modern world, but it has interesting undertones for the development of our cities. For centuries, the church spire remained as the focal point of most western cities. The Trinity Church was the largest building in New York until 1890, when the New York World Building was completed. This marked an end to the cathedral-dominated skylines of many cities across the world. Those church spires served as a symbol of piety, but the New York World Building's height allowed Joseph Pulitzer to expand his growing business without having to find a large swathe of land on the outskirts of the city. Growing taller served a practical purpose and it still does in many cases. It's that demand for space that truly drives up the average height of buildings in cities. Cities like Hong Kong do not have any super tall buildings, but the average height of buildings in Hong Kong is among the highest in the world and that is largely driven by the lack of space available. Hong Kong is confined by the sea on one side and the Chinese border on the other, while having a very mountainous landscape. There isn't a huge amount of land to build on. This forced buildings to grow taller to accommodate the city's population. When Hong Kong needed to expand their international airport, there was little space available. Instead, they decided to level two islands outside the city to create a new artificial island where the new airport is now located. This project added 1% to the total surface area of Hong Kong. When space is limited, humans are forced to get inventive to cope, but in many cities across the world, it is not an issue and these cities usually decide to expand outwards. This is called urban sprawl and it's been a topic of debate lately with calls to stop this decentralization of cities. Urban sprawl requires little micromanagement of resources. You simply continue to expand current utilities and roads and approve buildings on cheaper, undeveloped land. It's an easy solution to a growing population, but it creates many problems of its own and is completely unsustainable as populations grow. You cannot simply keep expanding the city and allowing these problems to escalate. It has huge environmental and social impacts. One of the most obvious, which my friend Wendover Productions spoke about in his last video, was an increasing commute time. With an increasing city diameter, the distances we have to cover to reach the city centre increases, and it is incredibly difficult to serve all of these far-flung suburban neighbourhoods with adequate public transport. This results in a city dependent on the car, our least efficient form of transport. This not only has social impacts, as a long commute is one of the highest and most controllable factors that affect our happiness, but the average American spends 17,600 minutes behind the wheel a year. Much of that is spent in gridlock traffic. That's equivalent to spending almost an extra 37 days at your traditional 8 hour, 9 to 5 job. But it also has a direct impact on pollution and air quality in the city too. That's 17,600 minutes of a car polluting the environment. Reducing our city's dependence on cars reduces our carbon footprint on this world. Urban sprawl affects our cities in other ways too. Spreading our cities creates water distribution problems. Here in Ireland, it is thought that up to 50% of the treated water is lost through pipe leakage, and that problem is not unique to Ireland. In 2010, it was reported that 3.3 billion litres of water was wasted in England and Wales through pipe leakage. Reducing the sprawl reduces the length of pipes needed, and thus reduces the chances of leakages, and the problem can be attenuated further by creating buildings with self-sustaining water supplies. This is becoming a growing trend and consideration among engineers. LEED, or Leadership in Energy and Environmental Design, is one of the most popular green building certifications used worldwide. It rates how resource efficient buildings are in their construction, energy use and water use. The Type A101 was awarded LEED's highest certification with a platinum certificate. It achieved this with its own dedicated water management systems and low flow water fixtures. This design ideology helped the Type A101 to decrease its potable water consumption by at least 30% compared to the average building consumption, saving about 28 million litres of potable water annually. When you also consider that in America, landscape irrigation is estimated to account for nearly one third of all residential water use, totaling nearly 9 billion gallons of water per day, it would be vastly more sustainable for a world where water is in ever increasing demand to create cities where we have a larger percentage of LEED certified high-rise residential buildings. 
This goes beyond just environmental impacts. There are a number of socio-economic motivations to creating more high-rise buildings too. I pointed out that urban sprawl results in longer commute times, and the roads and public transportation needed to facilitate those commutes are not free. They need to be maintained and built with your tax money. And while building up is more costly, that cost and risk is usually incurred on a private contractor and the cost of building up starts to decline once you reach a certain height. To build a skyscraper, there are a number of fixed costs, but many of these costs do not increase with the height of the building. Fixed costs like the cost of land, legal fees and design costs can be offset by building higher. If the building is built on a 100 square meter plot of land and the building has 40 stories, each floor only takes up 2.5 square meters of land. That has obvious economic advantages, especially when you consider design and material costs only start to go up when you reach around the 40th floor and that critical height is likely to go up as technology improves. Buildings like the Burj Khalifa may just be exuberant displays of wealth, but they do serve as technology demonstrators. For 25 years, the tallest building in the world was the Sears Tower, now known as the Willis Tower. It uses a bundled tube structure, which maximizes the amount of floor space, but if we scale this building to the size of the Burj Khalifa, its floor space would be dominated by structural elements and the interior would have no natural light. As mentioned in my last video, the buttress core of the Burj Khalifa provides the structural integrity needed to reach those heights while maximizing both the window access and usable space. This is vital knowledge and experience to have to allow building heights to keep growing while keeping costs down. So you may be thinking, why aren't there more high-rise buildings? If there are all these benefits, there must be reasons why we aren't building more of them. We will learn why after this quick side note. A lot of you have been admiring the footage I use in my videos, and most of it comes from Videoblocks.com, who have kindly sponsored this video. Videoblocks has one of the largest stock video libraries on the web, with over 2 million stock videos, After Effects and motion backgrounds. With a Videoblocks membership, you get access to over 2 million clips for 40% off per clip compared to competitor sites, and over 100,000 clips are included for free with your membership too. I get to use these videos with a 100% royalty free agreement. That means I can make money from my videos, which has allowed me to make this channel my full time job without worry of infringing any copyrights. Membership is usually $149 per year, but Videoblocks is offering an exclusive $50 discount if you go to videoblocks.com forward slash holidays or click on the link in the description below. So, the primary reasons we aren't building higher is because of city planning and regulatory problems. Take New York's growth in the early 20th century as an example. Building heights were growing and many were unhappy with it. At the time, Fifth Avenue was filled with stately mansions, homes to the wealthy families of New York like the Carnegies and Rockefellers. They worried that unless building heights were restricted, Fifth Avenue would turn into a dark canyon, overshadowed by these towering behemoths. These worries led to the 1916 zoning resolution, which allowed buildings to grow in height, but restricted their width as they grew. This is one of the primary reasons so many buildings in New York, built during that era, tapered towards their top. It was a measure to prevent buildings from blocking the sunlight below, but the regulation had loopholes and architects quickly exploited them. Between 1916 and 1960, the city's zoning code was amended 2,500 times. The 1961 zoning resolution brought in strict rules and introduced a new floor to area ratio rule that restricted building heights according to the district they were in. The floor to area ratio set how much floor space could be built on a plot of land. A floor to area ratio of 2 means you can build a 2 story building on your full plot or a 4 story building on half your plot. R1, R2 and R3 districts are low density zones like Staten Island and the Jamaica estates in Queens and they have a floor to area ratio of 0.5. Whereas major thoroughfares in Manhattan are R9 and R10 districts which have a floor to area ratio of 7.5 and 10 respectively. This floor to area ratio rule put pressure on designers to allocate more space to open plazas or other public spaces around the building to facilitate a taller tower, whereas the 1916 zoning laws resulted in tiered buildings that started right on the sidewalk. The 1961 zoning code encouraged privately owned public space to ease the density and claustrophobia of a high rise city and I think we can all agree that that is a move in the right direction. Zoning regulations like this are important to prevent brainless growth that destroy a city's character, but sometimes they are overzealous and prevent modernization altogether. Take Washington DC's zoning code that has been in place for over 100 years with little change. The Height of Buildings Act of 1910 prevents any building beyond 40 meters in height. That is incredibly restrictive and it has resulted in a city where the tallest structure is a giant stone obelisk and this thing. 
Even with a relatively small population, Washington has some of the worst traffic in the US. A study released this year by Inrex found that the people of Washington waste an average of 75 hours per year in traffic. That means their journeys take 75 hours more than if there was no congestion. They were second only to Los Angeles, who waste an average of 81 hours a year in traffic. LA is often singled out as a key example of this problem of unchecked outward growth. It was a key theme in the movie Her, where the car dominated urban sprawl of the present is juxtaposed with a vision of a glossy, clean, high rise future for our LA. The main character, Theodore, lives in a highly developed downtown LA. He lives in a high rise building and works in a high rise building. He's able to walk between them, and cars seem to have ceased to exist. He instead uses the extensive metro system to get around. The movie even designed a futuristic subway map of LA. To create this vision of the future, the producers digitally enhanced the city's existing skyline, while also mixing in shots from present day LA with numerous shots from Shanghai's Pudong district. Like this pedestrian skybridge, which allowed Spike Jones to film Theodore wandering through the urban jungle without having the cars at street level, interfering with the illusion of a city that has transcended the need for personal transport. That transformative change seems implausible and not likely in the near future, but cities can undergo metamorphosis when money and regulations are not an issue. Take the mid 19th century renovation of Paris as an example. Paris was once described by one of its residents as an immense workshop of putrefaction where misery, pestilence and sickness work in concert, where sunlight and air rarely penetrate, a terrible place where plants shrivel and perish, and where of seven small infants, four die during the course of the year. This is an incredibly stark description of Paris, when present day Paris is often fawned over for its wide boulevards, amazing architecture and extensive public transport system. Paris of old was plagued with problems caused by the outdated planning of its medieval past. Paris was in need of renovation and Napoleon III made it possible by giving the money and power needed to Baron Haussmann. He transformed these narrow streets and old dilapidated buildings into spacious boulevards. He revamped all these streets in red and created two new parks for the city's residents. Napoleon III and Haussmann helped transform Paris into the charming city of light that 16 million tourists now visit every year. But it may be time to start rethinking Paris's city planning once again. The lack of housing in central Paris has caused prices to raise so high that only the rich can afford it, forcing the working class families of Paris to the outskirts of the city, creating huge disparity of wealth between the centre and outskirts. This map shows the concentration of social housing as a percentage of total residences, with the largest percentages being located furthest from the city centre, and even now these people are being forced further outside the city limits as gentrification occurs. Paris is no stranger to revolts of the working class, with notable riots in 1968, 2006 and just this year Paris saw more riots, as new labour laws were passed giving employers more power to increase working hours, decrease holidays and decrease pay. The lack of affordable housing compounds these social problems, and the main cause of these prices is Parisians' unwillingness to build over existing buildings. During Haussmann's renovation of Paris, height restrictions on buildings were raised from 16.5 to 19 metres, but the transformation of Paris took place in a time where elevators did not exist. In 1965, the height restrictions were lifted, and the Mount Parnasse Tower was constructed soon after. A building that is loaded by Parisians. It sticks out from the surrounding buildings like a sore thumb. There is a fine line between progress and regression. Paris renovated to rid itself of the claustrophobic narrow streets of the past, building higher without thought will bring it right back to that. The construction of this building resulted in the height restrictions being reduced to 25 metres for central Paris. France is a heavily regulated country, and when its rulers decide they don't want change, change will not occur. But one part of Paris proves that modern high rise buildings can be introduced without destroying the character of the city. La Défense is Europe's largest purpose built business district, housing 180,000 daily workers. La Défense proves that skyscrapers can be incorporated into the historic background of Paris without destroying its chair. But La Défense is a financial district. It was built to create office space and houses just 25,000 permanent residents. There is little motivation to build high rise buildings to reduce housing prices, as it is cheaper to push people to the outskirts of the city. Paris is not alone in these problems. London has been criticised for the same problems and Vice News made an excellent documentary about the effects of this gentrification of working class neighbourhoods. There is no easy way of balancing preservation and growth, but we need to put our country's leaders under more pressure to consider this and not just follow the cheap easy route, because the problems will only get worse as our populations grow. 
If we allowed those height restrictions to stop us from building on 5th Avenue, the world would have been deprived of iconic buildings like the Empire State and Flat Iron Buildings. Great cities are not static, they constantly change and move with the times. The greatest of our modern cities like New York and Singapore function because their height enables a huge number of people to work and live on a small piece of land. That is something our world is going to need going forward as our populations continue to grow. Thanks for watching. You may have noticed this video is about twice as long as my usual videos. I wanted to experiment a bit and see how longer videos do on this channel, so please let me know what you think in the comments or on Twitter and tell me a bit about your city and how you would like to see it change. I also want to take this time to thank my Patreon supporters properly. There are 154 of you supporting this channel on Patreon and that is insane. You have helped me buy a new laptop so I can edit quicker, a new microphone to improve my audio, among other things. I cannot thank you enough for supporting and believing in this channel. It means the world to me. If you'd like to see more content or support Real Engineering, the links for my Patreon, Instagram, Facebook and Twitter accounts are below.